I'm Richard Baybor. I've been a surgeon for almost 20 years. It's the only thing I've ever really wanted to do. Mostly, I operate on cancer patients. Surgery's not pretty, but at least it offers a chance of cure. This is the sharp end of cancer. Most patients I treat ask the same question. What could I have done not to get cancer? And I have to admit, I just don't know. I've lost friends and loved ones to cancer too, and I see the suffering it brings every day here at work. No one's to blame for getting cancer, but we can all reduce our risk. I've decided to explore the other side of the cancer story, prevention. One in three of us will get cancer at some point in our lifetimes. What would it take to improve those odds? In this episode, we'll explore how our diets can help prevent cancer. We'll apply modern science to an ancient eating pattern and sort science from fiction when it comes to superfoods. We'll examine our cherished relationship with meat and sugar and discover how our waistlines impact our cancer risk. Up to a third of all cancer cases are linked to poor diet. I'd like to get a sense of how not to get cancer. Cancer is old. Ancient Egyptians, prehistoric humans, even dinosaurs got cancer. Athens is the birthplace of modern medicine. It's here cancer was named, dissected, and people first asked the question, how can we prevent cancer? Two and a half thousand years ago, the Greek physician Hippocrates had already noticed the power of food when he said, let food be thy medicine, and let medicine be thy food. There is one diet that is the gold standard for cancer prevention. It's an ancient eating pattern that originated right here, the Mediterranean diet. But in recent years, there are signs it's crumbling under the weight of Western food influence. UNESCO has placed a world heritage status on the endangered diet, just like the Acropolis itself. I'd like to know what the modern version of the diet looks like down on the streets of Athens. Let's start to cook. Like a cooker now. The taverna run by Chef Dimitri is a temple to the Mediterranean diet, which is plant-based, with a high intake of vegetables, fruits, nuts, legumes, and a moderate amount of fish and dairy food. It includes a small amount of meat and loads and loads of olive oil. All the healthy stuff. Chopped garlic. Yes, very good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Tomorrow, you start here, OK? Oh, you're going to give me a job? Yes. Oh. Now we put olive oil on the top. It smells really good already. Did we put garlic? Ah, well, we forgot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dimitri, did you know that this kind of diet can prevent cancer? Yes, he helped uh, the cancer, he helped the problem with the heart. Yeah. Because it's uh, no fat, it's fresh uh, fruit, it's a uh, fish, it's uh, something good. All the good things are in it. Yes. One problem in Greece is that people aren't eating like this anymore. It's very easy for everybody here to eat this, but uh, the last year everything uh, changed, everything. Yeah. Junk food. Junk food. Yes. Yeah. You like this? Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Yes. I'd like to know more about the evidence that the diet prevents cancer. So I'm heading to meet Dr. Antonia Tricopoli, who is a professor at the University of Athens and a world expert on the Mediterranean diet. She collated the World Health Organization data to analyze the diet's cancer preventing powers. Here is the Kalamata olive. This is Greece. This is Mediterranean. So, two and a half thousand years ago, the Greeks already knew that food protected us against cancer, and now science is telling us the same story. Yes, that's true that uh, the Greeks, they have said um, many things which they are proven 
today. There is evidence for colon, prostate, endometrium. There is evidence about breast cancer. So how does the Mediterranean diet prevent cancer? You know, I, I want to make, uh, to, to, to make clear that all the evidence refers to the pattern of the Mediterranean diet, not to individual foods. Yes, there are a lot of scientific evidence that individual foods, they might be beneficial. Of course, there is a lot of evidence for the beneficial effects of olive oil. Mm. But if you want to, to uh, adapt uh, the Mediterranean diet in your daily meals, then you have to learn how to cook with olive oil. You cannot eat 700 grams per day of zucchini raw. But you can eat 700 of zucchini cooked, yeah. even if they are cooked with olive oil, with oregano, with tomato, with garlic, with onions. So if there was a magic bullet component, would it be olive oil? Uh, yes, uh, olive oil, I think, is, is a magic uh, component. The magic of virgin olive oil is being revealed by science. Lab studies have shown that it contains bioactive compounds which are anti-inflammatory. Inflammation is a normal immune response to infection and injury, but chronic inflammation can cause DNA damage that can lead to cancer. Olive oil has a dampening effect on inflammation. It contains oleocanthal, which is a compound that works in a similar way to the drug ibuprofen. There are a number of fruit and vegetables rich in bioactive compounds that are linked to cancer prevention, and many of these have been labelled superfoods. Though the term superfood is really just a marketing gimmick, it's not a label that's recognised in science because no food has all the super properties. But I'm keen to know if some of the trendy ones branded as superfoods might actually have cheap and easy to find alternatives. That could offer cancer prevention for everyone, no matter the size of your wallet. Cow really has been pushed as a superfood. Mm. Um, so kale is really rich in something called glucosinolates. Um, and they've been demonstrated to help uh, reduce uh, the damage to DNA of cells. Those specific bioactive compounds that are rich in kale, we can also find in other green leafy vegetables, and um, vegetables such as broccoli, uh, green beans, and even some potatoes, particularly sweet potato variety as well. I'm not so sure about the taste of kale. I like broccoli much better. Yes. Cheaper, nicer. Brazil nuts. I love Brazil nuts. Great source of uh, bioactive compounds that have been shown in the lab to be anti-inflammatory and help keep our cells healthy. I sort of think of them as a little bit of a treat. Yeah, they are expensive and we have got some good alternatives like chickpeas, which again, a good source of plant-based protein. Cheap as chips too. And cheap as chips. How about goji berries, Claire? Raisins seem similar. Yeah, I mean, they're similar. They're high in antioxidants and vitamin C, which goji berries are too. They're a lot cheaper and, yeah, just as good. And that's the problem with this concept of a superfood. People seem to think that if they limit themselves to these uh, super fruits and vegetables, that that will help, you know, prevent them from getting cancer and live longer. But it's not goji berries that are going to do that. It's a variety of fruits and vegetables in our diet that have shown to be associated with a lower risk of getting cancer. So entirely achievable with relatively cheap local produce. Absolutely, without any expensive fancy superfoods. My journey to the Mediterranean has confirmed for me that food is medicine. Most of us are still not eating five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. We, myself included, need to try and eat a bit more of the good stuff. But should we serve it with meat? Down here at the beach, people are hanging with their friends and family, enjoying the sunshine, having a barbecue. 
meat. It's not just food, it's part of our culture. We all love bacon and sausages, but I'm increasingly in two minds about eating them. And that's because there is recent evidence that shows there is a link between meat consumption and cancer. What do you think of these sausages? I love meat. And I've been on a high protein, low carbohydrate diet for several years because I think it helps me maintain my body weight and my muscle mass. But it turns out that I might not be on the cancer preventing pathway after all. I'd think nothing of eating meat three times a day. Yeah, well, that's too much meat. <laughs> too much, yeah. But I bet a lot of people like that in New Zealand. Yeah, but the strong, consistent evidence is that um, processed meat causes bowel cancer, and red meat probably causes bowel cancer. How does fresh meat cause cancer? Well, we think that cooking red meat at high temperatures, like what you get when you barbecue or pan fry meat, yeah. leads to the production of chemicals. And these chemicals are thought to be carcinogenic. They've been shown in lab studies to cause cancer in animals. The other thing is that red meat is a really good source of heme iron. Yes. And heme iron can form in nitroso compounds in the gut, and we think these might damage the cells in the gut and lead to cancer. So the risk of red, unprocessed meat, not quite as much as processed meat. Yes, that's right. Processed meat is meat that has been transformed by salting, curing, or adding preservatives. So it's things like bacon, ham, salami, um, beef jerky. Some processed meats have um, nitrates in them, and these compounds can produce in nitroso compounds in the guts, which might damage the cells of the bowel and lead to cancer. It's a shame, because some of it tastes so nice. <laughs> Nobody really wants to hear the message of, like, don't eat meat. Yeah, it is a very unpopular message. I mean, I think starting with reducing processed meat is probably the best way to start. Because the evidence is really certain there that it does cause bowel cancer. Every 50 grand portion of processed meat eaten daily increases your risk of bowel cancer by 18%. The good news is that symptoms are easily detectable and are found early, successfully treatable. This is a giant inflatable bowel. It's called the colossal colon, and it's going to help me show you that bowel cancer can be prevented. Polyps, these little growths on the bowel wall, are common. The average 60-year-old has a one in four chance of having one. Mostly they're benign, but over time, some will turn into cancer. Step right up, step right up, come and have a look inside your colon. The colossal colon is being used to publicise a screening program being rolled out for the over 60s. The screening requires you to collect your own poo sample in a container and send it off for analysis. So they come and have a look inside our colossal colon. Have you ever wondered what the inside of your bowel might look like? Not an easy sell, but to save lives we have to get over our squeamishness. So a polyp is like a little mushroom on the inside of your colon that might cause a bit of bleeding that's picked up by the test. That's right. But it's not cancer yet. That's right. So something this small, uh, like a polyp, could just bleed a tiny little bit so small that you could never see it with your eyes. But you yeah. can pick it up with a screening test. Yes. And if it's that small, you might be able to get rid of it with a colonoscopy rather than even needing a big operation. Don't want this. Yeah. So when the tumours get bigger, they start to block the bowel, and that means that things can't get past here anymore, uh, and so the bowel becomes obstructed. And when it starts to get this big, the cancers can also grow through the wall of the bowel and access the bloodstream, which is like the highway to the rest of the body, which is how those cancer cells can then get stuck in other parts of the body. Colorectal cancer, most commonly known as bowel cancer, is the third most common cancer globally for both men and women. And it's your diet that impacts your risk. As I've learned more about the risks of bowel cancer and red meat, I've started to make sure that we have more white meat in our diet or meat-free days, and making sure that the portion size that we have is smaller and smaller and smaller. So people are saying a single portion of meat smaller than the palm of your hand is a good idea, or less than about 100 grams a day. And that can just be a little change you can make to lower your risks of bowel cancer.
So I don't have to give up eating red meat, but eating less of it will reduce my risk. Yeah, but we do need to be aware that high rates of meat consumption are risk factors for bowel cancer, and maybe we just need to think before we have that second sausage. Another easy change you can make if you're determined to have your bacon is to switch to nitrite-free meat. Nitrites are the chemicals used in the preserving process. They give bacon its nice pink colour. But in recent studies, the chemical is thought to have a damaging effect on DNA once inside the human body. Yet there are alternatives. Instead, bacon can be preserved using the traditional method of salting. Nitrite-free bacon uses this age-old solution. I'm going to run a little taste test, cook up some nitro-chemical-free bacon for the kids, and if they like it, we can switch over permanently. This is nitrite-free bacon. Want to try some? Yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, it looks burnt. No, it's not burnt. I've cooked it to perfection. <laughs> so what do you think of the bacon? It's pretty good. It's crispy. Mm. Bacon-y. Bacon-y and crispy. Does it taste like normal bacon? Yeah. Is it better than normal bacon? Probably. Probably better than normal bacon. What a ringing endorsement that is. I'm not that surprised that you guys like that bacon because it just tastes like normal bacon to me. As people become more aware of the toxicity of processed meat, nitrite-free bacon is much more popular and it can now be found in many supermarkets. The guidelines from the World Cancer Research Fund suggest eating little, if any, processed meat and to limit red meat to no more than three portions a week. So from now on, when I light up the barbie, I'm going to cook up some other delicious options. But if processed meat causes cancer, what about all the other processed food we eat? The French are famously protective of their cuisine, but even they are falling prey to the evolution of a Western diet. Ultra-processed food is a new category of food. It's made in factories from chemicals unheard of in the domestic kitchen. In a groundbreaking study, scientists here in Paris are making a link to cancer. Ultra-processed foods are um, a wide category of foods containing, for instance, prepackaged breads, uh, breakfast cereals, fizzy drinks, uh, dehydrated soups, for instance, or nuggets. Or processed meat, for instance, also. So these are foods that um, sometimes contain many food additives, but also uh, have a lower nutritional quality. These ultra-processed foods have become more and more present in the markets. They represent about 30 to 50 percent of all the energy brought in our diet. People who ate more ultra-processed food in our study uh, had a higher cancer risk. In fact, when we compared people who ate more ultra-processed food, 10 percent more, they had a 10 percent more risk of cancer compared to the other ones. So how does ultra-processed food cause cancer? We have several hypotheses to explain these associations. For, for instance, um, uh, the presence of food additives may explain part of the associations. It's not that these are unknown molecules. I mean, if you look at the, the, the food labels, you see all the food additives. But we don't have a true uh, idea of the uh, effect of each additive and also of the effect of cocktail multi-additive exposure. Because people who eat ultra-processed food do not eat one additives, they eat multi-exposure of cocktail of additives. When I was a child, there wasn't much ultra-processed food, but kids who are born now, what do you think's in store for them? This is a, a real problem because, of course, teenagers uh, in, in France and in other Western countries like to eat um, fast food, sodas and so on, which we already know that have a lower nutritional quality, but which may also convey uh, some maybe additives or contact materials or so on that may cause a cancer in many years. As I was growing up, the promise of the future and technology was tantalising. Perhaps we wouldn't even need to eat, we could just take a pill. Food technologists have worked out how to mimic food. 
They've replaced nutrients with chemicals. And we're all eating more ultra-processed food. Children are eating more ultra-processed food, and because of that, over time, their exposure will be high. <laughs> Here in New Zealand, we don't have a consumer warning system about ultra-processed food, so we have to work it out for ourselves. I usually spend about 30 minutes doing a family shop. I don't normally look at the packets very carefully, but today I am going to be looking for ultra-processed food. I'm interested to see if there's flavourings, additives, preservatives and colourings. So soy sauce, oh, I can't read the ingredients on here, deliberately tiny. Water, salt, vegetable protein, molasses, colour, flavour enhancer, acidity regulator, preservative. Mayonnaise, antioxidant 37B, colours 171161B, stabiliser 415, traces of soy flavours. All the bread contains preservative 223, emulsifies 481472. Fake bread. Pretty much everything I'm picking up has got some kind of industrial ingredients in it. Stabiliser 412466, steviol glycosides. Sounds delicious. Cheese, flavours. What does flavours mean? E370B. Polyrisinoleate. Polyrisinoleate. Can't even say that. Only a few of the items in my trolley are not ultra-processed food. Most of the things I've looked at contain industrial ingredients. The link between cancer and ultra-processed food is new. We don't really know which of the ingredients might cause cancer. But we do know that this type of food causes obesity. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. The average Western diet includes nearly double the sugar recommended by the World Health Organization. It advises no more than 12 teaspoons a day. But does sugar cause cancer? It's certainly the villain of our diet, but it's also the fuel of life. Every single cell in our bodies needs energy to survive. And everything we eat is converted to glucose to provide that energy. Sugar fuels everything in the body, and even if you cut it out of your diet, your body will make it from protein and carbs. There's no strong evidence to link sugar directly to cancer, but it can cause obesity. Guess what is the biggest preventable cause of cancer after smoking? I'm not too sure. What is the biggest preventable cause of cancer after smoking? I'd say the sprays and the and the poisons and things like that. Radiation from polluted things. Worry. Worry. Stress. Oh, uh, the sun. Preservatives. Uh, red meat. Pollution. Pollution. It's a good answer. Honestly, I have no idea. People say uh, drinking. Drinking. Alcohol. I don't know, alcohol. but I don't believe that because I like my alcohol. <laughs> yeah. A lack of exercise. Warm. <laughs> Do you want to open up the packet and just see what the answer is? Secondhand smoke, is it? Obes obesity. Oh, wow. No, no idea. But anyway, you enjoy your ice cream. Oh, mate. cheers, thank you. <laughs> no, no, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Oh, obesity. Mm. Wow. Does that surprise you? Somewhat, yeah. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Why didn't we think of that? Unfortunately, the obesity crisis is getting worse. In 2016, there were 1.97 billion overweight or obese adults across the world. Being overweight or obese is linked with an increased risk for 13 separate cancers, including breast and bowel cancer. Our obesity epidemic could soon turn into a cancer crisis. 
what we know at present is smoking is still the number one risk factor for cancer. But we've seen over time smoking rates fall every year on year across the world, particularly in the developed world. And we've seen obesity rates increase. And what we're doing is we're getting close to that point where these lines will cross and we'll see obesity overtake smoking as the number one uh, modifiable risk factor for cancer. Is this current generation going to have higher rates of cancer than my generation? With the levels of uh, overweight and obesity as they are at present, there's certainly potential for the younger generation to be much less healthy than the older one. I mean, our evidence shows that overweight or obese children are likely to be overweight or obese adults because it tends to track into adulthood. And we know that being overweight or obese increases the risk of cancer so that these children are more likely to have ill health in later life. I see how disabling obesity can be, and I see a lot of suffering that comes out of cancer. When I first started training as a surgeon, the relationship between obesity and cancer was not understood. And now it's becoming clearer and there's very new evidence that makes that link even more strongly. It's a real worry for me because I work in both those fields and they seem to be converging. Today I'm having a consultation with Malia. She struggled with weight for most of her life and now has precancerous cells in her womb. Malia. Hi. hi. Richard Babel, hi. Hello. Koro. Koro. How long have you been overweight? All my life. <laughs> I don't Even think... as a child? Yeah. Um, I don't ever remember being skinny like my siblings. <laughs> have you ever been able to lose weight? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So how much weight have you lost in the past and how have you done um, it? Well, I'm at my heaviest now at 164 and I'm um, but I've actually been down to 120 and then I go in between there. <laughs> how have you achieved that weight loss? Just exercise, diet. What do you, are you exercising at the moment? Uh, yes. What do you do? Gym. How often do you go? So I try and go every morning. Every morning? Yeah. Like seven days a week? No, no. Monday to Friday. Friday, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good on you. Do you know much about weight loss surgery? Only what I've seen on TV. <laughs> this is an opportunity, perhaps, to prevent cancer. Once a person reaches the clinical threshold for obesity, a body mass index over 30, it means it's near impossible to lose weight and keep it off through dieting and exercise. Our bodies default to a weight set point with our physiology conspiring to keep us fat. Anyone who's ever been on a diet will know how hunger feels. You may weigh 150 kilos, but after a day on just 500 calories, your body will act like it's starving to death. So how do you lose weight and reverse the corresponding cancer risk once you're obese? The last resort is weight loss surgery. Okay, Malia, it's very interesting because you've got changes in the cells in your womb which are on the spectrum of change towards cancer cells. And we are hoping by doing the surgery that we can get those to change back to normal cells. Removing Malia's stomach will change the hormones that drive her hunger and her ability to eat, which will lead to weight loss and hopefully change her precancerous cells back to normal. Weight loss surgery prevents cancer. It's well established. There are huge clinical trials which show that, that particularly in women, the rates of cancer after surgery come down by 50%. In obese patients, the whole body is just a little bit inflamed. And inflammation is one of the very important drivers of cancer. But weight loss surgery is an individual solution. And surgeons like me are the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Surgery can't solve a world obesity problem. It's all finished, you're just waking up. That will take dedicated government policy change. It's not too late to fix this crisis for future generations. We have years before obesity becomes the leading preventable cause of cancer. Action now could save millions of lives.
I'm in Milan, a city famed for its extravagance, to find out about the power of going without. Some of the most exciting emerging science around cancer prevention focuses on fasting. Professor Walter Longo has spent the last quarter century investigating the effects of fasting. And one of his discoveries is that fasting mice live longer and have fewer cancers. A finding he's now applying to humans. Most of what we know now about humans, we know it from mice. But in mice, clearly, what fasting does is to shrink organs, essentially, and, uh, and shrink cells. And then it is really the refeeding that is doing lots of the uh, rebuilding job, right? So once the mouse or the person goes back to a normal diet, that's when everything that has been broken down and removed uh, is being rebuilt. When we fast, Volta says, we give ourselves a break to rest, renew and rebuild because we stop producing a hormone called insulin-like growth factor one. IGF-1 instructs our cells to rapidly grow, divide, make more cells and grow and divide and on and on. It turns babies into toddlers, toddlers into children and children into adults. A high calorie, high protein diet triggers IGF-1 production and Volta's research suggests for cell longevity it's important to occasionally pause IGF-1, and he advocates doing this by fasting. Volta believes it's important to periodically recreate the kind of fasting state our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have experienced. To do this, he's devised a low-protein, low-carbohydrate, plant-based meal plan that tricks the body into thinking it's fasting, so it enters a cellular protection and rejuvenation mode. He's aptly named it the fasting mimicking diet, because while you receive essential nutrients, you still feel the hunger as your body doesn't recognise it's being fed. Volta recommends doing the fast for five days every three months. Fasting mimicking diet is really about going back to where we come from. And so it's what, something that I call being in tune with evolution. So being in tune with our history. We come from having to fast, you know, not being able to avoid fasting for more than probably six months a year. Or, and I think in a sense, that if we don't do it, something is missing, you know? It just brings you back and resets you in a way that uh, that it used to be done naturally. I've always thought my own diet was pretty good. Mr. Babber, do you want to drink some lettuce now? But I'm beginning to worry if it's too high in protein. Even though I feel healthy and fit, the health of cells is invisible on the outside and hard to measure. I'm having a blood test today to measure my IGF-1 levels before I go on the fast. I don't like needles very much. The lab will send the results to Volta to analyse. Hello. Hi, Volta. Okay. All right, so. Your worried look is starting to make me worried. <laughs> you have um, some of the markers that are uh, either uh, borderline or a little bit above uh, where they should be. And these include uh, fasting glucose, uh, your cholesterol, um, and uh, your insulin levels. This IGF-1 is uh, 191. Uh, the ideal range seems to be about 140, 145. So your high IGF-1 is probably um, a representative of your lifestyle. Yes. Meaning that you probably have a fairly high uh, protein intake, and in a, in a fairly Western uh, type diet, then you're definitely in the quite high uh, risk of uh, developing cancer. So you're saying that if I keep going like this, then the chances are that I'm going to get some kind of cancer, prostate cancer or colon cancer? Yes, uh, you have uh, about a 50-50 chance that at some point you'll be diagnosed with, uh, with cancer. <laughs> 
everything you see there for most people is completely reversible. So, so then, you know, it, it'd be nice to see what, what happens after you do one cycle of the fasting and eating diet. I'm a little bit taken aback by these tests because it indicates to me that my risk of developing cancer is quite high. To me, 50% is quite high. I don't want that to happen. And so I'm willing to try pretty much anything to bring those risk factors down. Well, that's sobering news. Tomorrow, I start my five-day fasting mimicking diet, and it won't be easy. This is a medical fast, not to be undertaken without supervision. Day one of the fast. The more I think about it, the more I'm daunted by it. Look, that's half my breakfast. <laughs> Algal oil capsules. And then I can have my nut bar. I'll start on 1150 calories for the first day, then I'm down to a miserable 800 calories a day for the next four. And how's the crepe? Is it good? Amazing. So, beginning of day two, I feel okay. That's breakfast, lunch and dinner. There, a couple of bars, a couple of soups, a couple of packs of olives and some tea. Not very yummy. <laughs> Could really murder a sausage with some tomato sauce. Last night I had a body ache hunger, just pervading my entire being. The drive to eat is very strong, you know, and I've heard it described as like a current in the river that, you know, people with obesity have to swim against. Constantly aware of what other people are eating, what's on advertising, what shops you go past what's in the fridge. Day four of the fast and I am definitely irritable. Lots of things have been annoying me. I am having a little bit of trouble sleeping last night. It's kind of awake, and asleep, awake, asleep. Definitely kind of feel a little bit wired. Must be kind of not sleeping as deeply because my body wants me to be awake in case some prey wanders across my path. <laughs> I'm tired and I feel low energy. I've had enough. Just got one more night to go. I think I can do it. I've just been hungry for five days been hyper aware of smells all over the neighbourhood. Place of Barbecue Central. I just feel so ravenous. I just strangle someone for their ice block. Today's day six, which is no longer fasting day, which means that I've completed a five-day fast, and now I can eat. Mm -hmm. I've got a crusty bread with some camembert on it. I've been dreaming about this all week. Oh, hi, Walter. I've done the fast, and I did my blood tests. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's moving in the right direction. Um, I, I'm looking at the numbers right now. Jeff one didn't drop very much. It dropped a little bit. Um, and uh, but this is normal. How many points did my IGF one go down? No, it didn't go down very much. It went from one to 187. My IGF one was 100 and 
92 before, and it came down to 187. So I was kind of hoping that it would come down a little bit more. If you have lots of animal proteins in the diet on a daily basis, uh, it's pretty tough for the for the system not to respond to that. Yeah. And I mean, it may respond if somebody was doing many cycles of the fasting making diet, but certainly um, we know that if you feed people protein things, you see the IGF-1 going up and up. What do you think of my cancer risk and what should I do to reduce it in terms of diet? There are two things you can do. Uh, um, and one is reduce protein intake, particularly animal protein intake, and you should see the IGF-1 dropping. And two, continue to do uh, fasting mimicking diets uh, maybe every three or four months. And the two things uh, in, uh, in the long run should get uh, not just IGF-1, but everything else should get to, to move to the, to the normal range. These things take time, there's no quick fix. Others take time, and, yeah. uh, and a GF1, at least in your case, seems to be yeah. uh, one of them. You know, once again, thank you so much for all your time. Yeah, you're very welcome. Mmm, food for thought. Volta's fasting mimicking diet was quite difficult, and I would have thought with the difficulty of it that a little bit disappointed in how much of an effect it had on that marker IGF-1. An encouraging thing is that he says, which I've also kind of have a sense of this myself, is that second and third time round it's easier and also the effect is greater. So I am going to try it again and I'd like to see more of an effect. In our calorie-packed modern world, the notion of not eating seems nothing short of revolutionary. Fasting isn't for everyone, but it's shown me we don't have to be constantly consuming. It's okay to feel hungry. I plan to be more mindful about how I'm eating. The human body is a finely tuned biological machine. We are born of the earth and we've been shaped to thrive on fueling ourselves on the food that grows around us. The closer we align our diets to nature, the lower our cancer risk. But we aren't motivated by health. We are driven by hunger. So let's use our desire for food to eat our way to better health. More of nature's medicine means less time at the doctors.